You guys ready? All right, well, um, I'll begin with a word of prayer. I think it's time. Yep, it's time. I'll start. <clears throat> Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for this day again. I thank you as class. Just ask you just uh, you be glorified in what we do and that we don't all understand a little bit more about your creation today together, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Here is the attendant sheet. So, um, the good news is that uh, we didn't do the algebra last time wrong. Uh, the bad news is that uh, I didn't do the algebra wrong, I guess. I don't know. I mean, so um, <clears throat> in a nutshell, the situation is this. Um, for an elastic collision in two dimensions, um, glancing collision, the, um, the angle between the, uh, the resulting after the collision balls uh, is, is going to be 90 degrees only if the, ang if the uh, masses are equal. So we needed the equality of the masses in order to get the 90 degrees result. If you watch the video that I um, you know, sent the announcement out about, you can see the derivation at around minute 20. And it's not that hard. Um, so sorry about that. Um, I just remembered it wrong, obviously. So, hey, here's an application. In exercise 8.30, exercise 8.30 in the, um, the assigned homework, uh, you have a collision. Um, there are two asteroids of equal mass in an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter collide with a glancing blow. Asteroid A was initially traveling at 40 meters per second. A with respect to an inertial frame, asteroid B was at rest. It's deflected 30 degrees and the asteroid B is deflected uh, 45 degrees. So you got like, I'll draw a picture here, A, here's B, this is before, and then it's in outer space. So afterwards, you have the one, it's going that way, the other one's going this way. So this is given to be 30 degrees, this is given to be 45 degrees, um, A and B. Now I'm not going to work this problem out, I just I want to talk about it for a minute. So what can you tell me about the collision? The if the, are no, the masses are equal, they're given to be equal. <laughs> the masses are given to be, the masses are given to be equal. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, well that, that's, in, that's baked into the cake of the problem. You, you can't get away from that. Yeah. That's right. This is, this is an inelastic collision. So when you're working this problem, do not try to conserve kinetic energy because you can't. It's not elastic. If you trust the derivation that I sent you a link to. All right. You really should watch the second link, though. It's the more interesting one. <laughs> Just saying. You have to click it to find out. <laughs> Someone says don't. <clears throat> so let us discuss the, uh, the ballistic pendulum example. So here is example two. So example one, basically, I'm just giving you a little bit of advice about 8.30, which is don't assume kinetic energy is conserved because it's not. So, sometimes kinetic energy is conserved, sometimes it's not. Usually it's not. 
all right? Momentum has to be conserved, that, that, that is a thing. So here's the ballistic pendulum. I'm gonna show you the kind of like the most um, plain Jane version of it, I guess. So I've got a big mass, mass big M, all right? I've got a little mass, little M. It's got velocity V naught, all right? A bullet, a mass, and then, so this is before, and then afterwards, the, um, so let's put the floor, let's we'll put it so the mass is just barely above the floor. If you can envision such a thing. Just, just a little bit above the floor, all right? And then, <clears throat> so afterwards, um, the mass goes to a height h. And by the way, um, the velocity, okay, so if you, if you want to conceptualize this problem better, um, you can think of this mass as being a cat. All right, and so suppose the mass is a cat, the cat is tied to a string, um, it's alive, and uh, then the bullet hits it, and the bullet sticks in the cat, like so. And then, um, if you want the cat to still be alive, you, you can. If you want it to be dead, that's also fine. Like whatever you think is, is more, makes the, whatever makes the problem more ethical. It's dead? It's, no, okay, fine. If you don't want it to be a cat, you could make it your worst enemy. Like whatever you like. I mean, it's all up to you. <laughs> it needs to it needs to be. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. We don't have the physics for it flailing around. Very good point. I like that. So the question is, what's h? What height? What height does the mass swing up to, given that the other mass embeds in it after it's shot? All right, there are other versions of this problem where the bullet goes through and the, and the velocity is reduced on the bullet. You're given the velocity before and after. Like that's another version of this problem, but let's start with this one. So let me show you how I solved this on a physics test that I took as an undergraduate at, at NC State some time ago. And I, I felt pretty good about myself. I was like, well, energy's conserved. It's gravity, right? So one half little m v naught squared should equal to one half um, you know, basically, what, what's the final energy? At the top, at, this is at the top, right? So, you know, highest point. That's given, all right? So, like, it's not highest point, the velocity is zero, right? Vf would be equal to zero there, right? So, what's the, uh, what's the energy? Well, there's no kinetic energy. It's all potential energy, and this is all supposed to be happening near the surface of the Earth. So, um, setting potential energy equal to zero at the floor, I'd have m, big M, plus little m, gh, right? Conservation of energy. Yeah? And then, so I said, okay, great. So the height is given to be, you know, basically one half m v naught squared divided by m plus m g. And I put a box around it, and I felt... I felt like I'd accomplished something. I finished this problem easy. Went on to other harder problems, right? And I was, I was proud of myself. And then I talked to my friend, Somber Paul. There are two Pauls. There's Somber Paul and Crazy Paul. Somber Paul was um, really, really good at physics. Like, really good. And especially so after he dropped his uh, mechanical engineering major. Um, he was a mechanical engineer for some time. But then um, he had a fluid mechanics professor that he, and I quote, wanted to punch in the face. I think it was that guy. Anyway, one of his professors, he, every time he went to class, he wanted to punch him in the face. So he had to drop the major for that reason. Paul's not generally, somber Paul is not generally a violent person, as you can imagine. Um, but after he dropped his mechanical engineering major, I was kind of hanging with Paul before he did that. After Paul dropped his mechanical engineering major, he became, well, we used to joke that if you looked at him during a test, you could see a faint yellow glow as he sort of like, he was, he was reaching Super Saiyan status, right? I mean, it was there. It was, we were watching this in college, right? That was the, uh, just coming out then. You guys will probably don't even know what I'm talking about, but do you know, do you know about Dragon Ball Z? Oh, so you're cultured. Good. All right. So you are, you are people of culture. Very good. 
Um, so I went after the test. I'm walking and I feel good about myself. I feel like I've solved this problem. I, I got that one. And then I'm like, yeah, I just, I conserved energy. And he's like, Paul's like, yeah, and momentum. And I'm like, what? Yeah, you know, conserve momentum. Because momentum has to be conserved when the bullet hits the, the pendulum. And I was like, oh, oops. Yeah, so this is not true. This is not the case. Energy is not conserved in this process. All right? So what you have to do to do this problem correctly, unlike me the first time, I did get half credit, so I guess I credit the... Oh! <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, so there's three, st there's three steps here. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll put it over there. Ah, I've got the eraser dust in my eye. That's never good. Yeah. Ah, now I got the eraser mist in my eye. Mm. All right, so there's, there's three steps. Step one is what's given. So you've got your initial mass M and you've got the pendulum that's just sitting there minding its own business doing nothing. Then right after right after it's hit, all right, right after it's embedded, well it's still at the bottom. There is some initial velocity, let's call it V1. This is just after the bullet hits the pendulum and is embedded, all right? And then step three, <clears throat> step three, it's got the upswing, all right? And, and M. so M, the mass is M plus M here, and it's, you know, it's swung to the height H, which we're interested in. So we have to conserve momentum as the bullet impacts the pendulum, and then we conserve energy on the upswing. It is true energy is conserved, as you swing from here up to, you know, if I draw it in the same picture, it's like, you know, up here, right? So, I guess I'll get rid of this picture. Um, <clears throat> if you guys don't mind me doing that, but. Okay, so here we go. To start with, we have MV naught is equal to um, what? So that's the momentum before. The momentum just after it gets hit here, right, would be m plus big M v1. So the initial velocity after the bullet impacts is given by uh, m v naught divided by big M plus little m. All right. So there you go. That's the velocity right after the bullet embeds in the mass. And then I have one half little m plus big M v1 squared is equal to little m plus big M gh. Because energy is conserved in the upswing after the bullet impacts. Of course, there you can divide by, you see this? We could do some algebra here. Um, so these guys cancel out, and we're just left with h is equal to, you know, one half v1 squared divided by g, which then we can plug this over into there and get the answer. So we've got like 1 over 2g times parentheses mv naught over little m plus big M quantity squared. There you go. That's, that's the height right there that it goes to. So this is the ballistic pendulum. Now there are variations on this theme in the homework where instead of the bullet just embedding in the pendulum, it goes through, all right? So in that situation, the conservation of momentum is a little bit different, right? You have some momentum that stays with the bullet after it's been slowed down, and you have the rest of the momentum going into the you know, initial swing, upswing of the, of the mass. 
right? Any any questions about this? Uh, what if the what if the bullet bounced off? Interesting question. If the bullet bounced, so how do you want it to bounce? <laughs> so you same. <laughs> Say it, b it bounces back with the uh, with the same velocity it came at. Yes. For instance, we could do that. Is this a homework problem? No. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. I'd still do it, but um, so you're saying before pendulum's just sitting there minding its own business. If you'd like, you can make the pendulum a cat, and you got the bullet um, coming on here, a little mass m at v naught, and then afterwards. We have the mass big M with some initial velocity V1 we don't know, and the bullet has rebounded, like ricochet, at V0 the other direction, right? And then the question is, if that's the situation, how far does it swing up? What's the height that it goes to, right? Good question. That's a, that's a, that's a nice modification of example three. Yeah. Nope, nope, nope. So here's the deal. So we have m, m v naught. Uh, that's the initial momentum, right? The final momentum is what? It is minus m v naught because it's going the opposite direction, right? Momentum is a vector quantity. So we're treating it one dimensionally here because we, because we can. <laughs> um, I'll do a two dimensional momentum thing next, okay? Don't worry. Um, and then plus what? Plus big M. V1. See? So that makes big M V1 actually equal to 2 times M V0. This actually doubles the speed, I think. Well, it's, it's not quite comparable because the mass is not stuck to the mass afterwards. So it's a little bit different in that sense. But V1 is this case 2 M V0 over big M. That's the initial speed after the bullet bounces. And then, um, and then to find the height, this time, you know, in this here, I'm going to set 1 half um, big M V1 squared equals to <coughs> um, big M GH. I don't do M plus M because the bullet is not stuck to the pendulum in this example, right? So it's just the mass of the pendulum swinging upward. And uh, so the m's cancel, and we get h is v1 squared over 2g. Well, I guess that's always true. <laughs> that's funny. And then um, I'm easily amused. Don't judge me. 2g, um, apparently 2m v0 over big M squared. And so there you go, that would be the answer in that situation. There are endless variations on this theme, right? You can do something where the bullet passes through the mass, but loses half of its velocity, right? That would like half the momentum, I think, or something like that compared to like example one. Anyway, there's, there's variations on this theme, but to summarize, to solve the ballistic pendulum problem, conserve momentum as the bullet hits the mass according to the givens that you're given and then conserve energy on the upswing, and that, that's how you solve this problem. So. <clears throat> let us solve the, uh, let's solve the expl exploding projectile problem. Um, so the exploding projectile problem. Exploding projectile problem, that would be my example four for today. Um, we could have something like this. The uh, bullet's fired, all right? And then uh, 
each second here. Let me read. So bolt's fired. And then at the top of the trajectory, just to keep things relatively simple, um, so you have a mass M, all right, and it's fired. I'll put the, the cannon under the ground to make things easier to think about. And so the, the mass is fired with the initial velocity V naught at some angle theta. And then <clears throat> mass M. At the top, typically two equal mass fragments, just to make things simple. Um, will go flying off, all right? And um, so you can have one uh, flying up here in velocity one, all right? So you got like m over two goes that way. And then I think in your, one of the homework problems you have, the other one's going directly downward, all right? So I'll, I'll do that for you guys. m over two goes directly downward like that, all right? Now you're not told the angle that the upper fragment goes, right? Um, you got to figure that out. So let's see here. Let's call that angle alpha. So what's the situation here? How do we, and then and the typical question then can be is, uh, you know, where does the, um, well, I mean, there's two kind of, so here's some questions we can ask, question. Um, let, let me call this, let me call this fragment, um, let me call this fragment A, let me call this fragment B. So question is, where does A land? Uh, another question we could ask is, <laughs> where does B land? Another question we could ask is, how much energy released in the explosion, right? These are all questions we can ask. Another question I can ask is, what's alpha? All right, these are all questions we could ask. Oh, way over. <sighs> it doesn't bode well for the rest of this lecture. It was an omen of mistakes to come. <clears throat> um, as many as it takes. So, <clears throat> so is momentum conserved in this example? The answer is yes and no. Right? Is momentum conserved as we think of going from the initial time up to the zen you know, up to the apex of the flight. Well, no, momentum is not conserved. Gravity has time to reduce the momentum, right? So the initial momentum would not be equal to the momentum, you know, right before the explosion. However, we can say this, the momentum right before the explosion would be equal to the momentum right after the explosion. That, that's where momentum is conserved. That's where conservation of momentum is helpful. So let's think about it that way. So we've got, you know, M right before the explosion here. And let's conserve momentum before and after. Now, what is the momentum of the mass right before the explosion? So <clears throat> we would have um, the mass times V naught cosine theta times zero. That, that would be the momentum right before the explosion. See, because the velocity of the mass at the top of the flight is just equal to the x velocity of the projectile before the explosion, right? Which is constant because there is no acceleration in the x direction, right? So whatever initial x velocity you give it from the cannon, that's what it has. And of course the y velocity would initially be v naught sine theta and it slows to zero as you get to the top of the flight, right? So the y momentum is zero at the top of the flight, yeah. So we are assuming this is happening at the apex. Yeah, we're happy, exactly. So if you want me to make this problem more fun, we could make the explosion happen somewhere else. Can we do that next? I'll save that one for the test. No? No? Well, let's, let's just keep it at the apex for the moment. This is like um, problem, this is very similar to problem, I'll tell you in a second. This is more or less, um, well, where'd that thing go? 
Do, 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 do. This is problem 8.96 I'm working right now. This is essentially 8.96. <clears throat> no, I'm not putting numbers in it, but that shouldn't be a problem for you guys to put numbers in. Okay, so <clears throat> then what? Well, that's equal to what? That's equal to um, the, ma the A, let's do A first. Um, well, let's do B, B is easier, let's do B first. So the mass of B is M over two. What's the velocity of B? Well, let's call it VB, right? Whatever that is, we've got what? We've got uh, zero and apparently minus VB, right? Because I'm, I'm saying that the magnitude of the B velocity is VB, but it's downward, so minus VB, okay? And then what? Well, plus M over two, and then what do we got? Um, so what, how would you figure out what's the direction vector here? How do you find a unit vector in the direction of A? What would that be? Cosine alpha, sine alpha. Yeah, co cosine alpha, sine alpha. Uh, yes, times VA, very good. So that altogether is the A velocity, right? Right after the explosion saying, labeling the fragment which flies up as the A part. All right, and that's conservation of momentum before and after the explosion. Um, how many variables are going on here? So typically in this problem, V naught would be given, um, the angle would be given. So, um, looks like I don't know, I don't know the angle, right? And I also don't know um, I don't know VB. I'm trying to think how many variables. It looks like I've got one. I think I've got three unknowns at the moment, right? Alpha, the A, and the B. That's three unknowns. Well, I'm, 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 I'm fair enough. Let's say we're given theta and v naught. Actually, m doesn't matter. Like, they could give you m, and probably that would matter um, in terms of, like, calculating energy. But for here, this equation, we could cancel the m out. But I don't think that's enough information, because we have three unknowns, and... Um, this is a vector equation, but it's only got two equations, right? Because you got the x component, the y component. So I'm pretty sure in that problem, something else is given. Let's see what it is. In problem 8.96, mine is a 20 kilogram projectile filed, fired at an angle 60 degrees above the horizontal with a speed of 80 meters per second. At the highest point of the trajectory, the projectile explodes into two fragments with equal mass, one of which falls vertically with zero initial speed. Aha! So in the problem, in the book, or rather in your homework, we're also given VB is equal to zero. There we go. That's a different, different situation, right? Okay, so now we've just got two, I mean, now we just got two unknowns and we're good to go, right? So if the VB is given to be zero, as it is in problem 8.96, then we're up against what? You've got, you know, M V naught cosine theta is equal to um, M over 2 V A cosine alpha. And you've also got, you know, 0 is equal to um, dude. Whoa. Seriously? That's impossible. Yeah. Is there, is there an 
the problem as stated in the in the in the electronic homework is impossible. What? What's up? No, I mean it just can't be, right? I mean it's just impossible. The momentum, like if if this goes, if this, if B is going zero, that means that the final momentum is that way, whereas the initial momentum was just directly horizontal. Momentum's not conserved. It's manifestly not conserved by the book's parameters. So, no. So we're going to reject the book and say that VB is given to be, I don't know, 10. Okay, so 10 meters per second. Great. <laughs> um, so with that, we would have something far more reasonable, like uh, minus m over 2 times 10 meters per second. Uh, ba -da -ba -da. Plus what? m over 2. Uh, yeah, VA sine alpha. And then we can solve this. Two equations, two unknowns, we can work it out. Um, tell you what, let me make up some numbers here to make it easier for us to think through. I'll put theta equal to um, 30. 30, okay, 30 degrees, and we'll make V naught equal to 50. I like that. That sounds reasonable. So if we do all that, <clears throat> what's that give us? The M's cancel. So we've got, uh, we got here, um, good grief, uh, V-naught, where'd I go? Okay, V-naught cosine theta equals to VA cos alpha. Let me do a little algebra here. Um, 10 meters per second is equal to VA sine alpha. Um, so if I divide these equations, I get, um, if I divide the bottom equation by the top, it gives me that um, the tangent of alpha is equal to 10 meters per second divided by the cosine, uh, by V naught cosine theta. Where'd the two will go? Um, I just divide this equation by m over 2. Oh, still in the marker. Thank you. And that does change things a little bit. That puts a, oh man, now I got to think. Um, aye, aye, aye. Fine, I'll write it out. 10 meters per second divided by v naught cosine theta is equal to VA sine alpha divided by VA cos alpha over 2. I did that so the VAs cancel. Of course, that puts a 2 here, which I could bring over to here. Um, so tangent alpha is apparently 10 meters per second divided by 2 times 50 meters per second times the cosine of 30 degrees. So I've worked myself into a corner now. What's alpha equal to? Eh. What? Ten. <laughs> 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 10 divided by 100, um, and then divide by cosine 30. Am I in degrees? Eh, I'm in degrees. So I get, I get uh, 3, root 3 over 15 for the fraction, and then if I inverse tangent that thing, I get 6.59 um, degrees. So that's inverse tangent of the fraction above. I think that might make sense. 
let me think about it. So, um, well, I guess I won't know for sure until we, we calculate the, um, the VA. What, what, what's VA going to be then? So VA then equals what? VA is equal to 10 meters per second divided by sine alpha, right? I'm solving this equation here for VA. So take the sine of that. Um, divide by 10. Invert that thing. I get 87.18 uh, meters per second for VA. Let me, let me check that. If I take 87.18 and I multiply it by the cosine of uh, 6.59, I get um, 86.6. Is that what I want? Huh. Did anybody else get that? Yeah. Any, every got this? Okay. Um, oh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Just, just hold on just a second here. So 80s, what was the initial velocity in the x direction here? 50 times what? 50 times cosine 30. Okay, so like, basically we had, um, I haven't, I haven't stated the mass yet. What would you guys want the mass to be? Ten. What's that? Seven. Seven? Ten. ten. I like ten. Ten kilograms it is. So um, if it, the mass is originally ten kilograms, the, um, you know, anyway, the initial velocity in the x direction was 43.3 meters per second. So what this is saying is it basically doubles it, I think. It's not quite that. It's a little bit more than double it. That kind of makes sense to me. All right, so, so then question is, I'm, I'm, I think that's right. Um, so where does A land? I, I, this is a dumb question. Where does B land? Yeah. <laughs> Just right below it, right? I mean, right below it, whatever. So th to figure out where that is, what would you do? Right, you, can, you guys can figure that out. <clears throat> I'm going to work in the middle board here. <clears throat> so, let's see here. So you guys, tell me, tell me, tell me then, um, where is this point relative to the initial point? If we had, uh, you know, the, what I wrote over there, 30 degrees and 50 meters per second. So how far is this? So how much, how much time does it take to get there? We had VF equals to, you know, 50 meters per second times the sine of 30 degrees minus GT, right? Well, the time to the top. So the time to the top, if I call that TF, it would be, um, you know, uh, 25 meters per second divided by 9.8 meters per second squared. So the time to the top is 25 divided by 9.8. And so that is 20, uh, 2.55, 2.55 seconds to the explosion from the initial firing, okay? And so the answer for part B, change in X, would just be, you know, V naught X times the, times the time, which would be 50 meters per second times the cosine of 30 degrees times my 2.55 seconds. So the answer where B lands 
is apparently 110, 110.5 meters over. All right, so what's, what's Y at the top? Y at the top would be what? It would be um, 50 meters per second times the cosine, excuse me, times the um, sine of 30, right? That times time minus one half GT squared. Of course, you could use the top, the formula for the top, um, you know, the formula for the maximum height if you wanted. But I'm just, since I already figured out the time, I might as well just do it this way. So we've got 25 meters per second uh, times 2.55 seconds roughly minus 4.9 meters per second squared times 2.55 seconds quantity squared. That gives me by my calculations 31.89 Probably the last digit's not significant there, but there we go. So in a nutshell, I've just figured out that where the explosion happens, right, where the explosion happens is the point uh, 110.5 meters, comma, 31.89 meters, right? And I'm assuming that the point where the bullet is fired is the origin. So I repeat my question. Where does A land? Can you figure it out? On the ground. On the ground? Yeah, that's, that, seems, that seems, seems reasonable. Now, so we are assuming that we're talking about level ground here, right? So A lands somewhere over here, right? We know where B lands, like right here, right? OK. Uh, I'm sorry, the book has a uh, physically impossible problem in it. That's a little disappointing. But um, there it is. Anyway, yeah. What do we do about that problem? Damn. Take your best guess. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I did build 10% bonus into the homework for this reason. So anyway. Um, <clears throat> all right, so. OK, so. What's the, what's the situation here? So for A, what, what are the kinematic equations for A? We have what? We have Y is equal to, what's the initial Y? Well, let's say 31.89, right? And um, if you don't mind, I'm going to just, I'm going to put T equals to zero for the A equation here, if that's okay. If you like, I can, if you want, I can keep the same time and write the equations like that. I mean, whatever. But <clears throat> what's the initial um, what's the initial y velocity for a? We know VA, right? VA was so we do you know plus 87 one eight meters per second times what? Times the sine of what? Sine of alpha, which is the sine of you know 6.59 degrees. And then times times t. Although you know, if you want, if you want, I could put t minus tf. If you like to stick with time zero being the initial time and sticking with time being time, but I just think it's easier, perhaps for me, just instead of putting that, let me just call it like delta t, since it's bothering me. And then minus what? Minus one half g delta t squared. That's the y equation, right? What's the x equation for a? It would be, you know, 110.5 meters plus, you know, VA, which is 87.18 meters per second times the cosine of 6.59 degrees, right? Times my delta T. So to find where the projectile lands, what do we need to solve? We need to look for 
basically y a equals to zero, right? That's going to tell me where it lands. That's a quadratic equation, right? So I've got um, 31.89 plus um, Help me out here. What's 87.18 times cosine of 6.59? That gives me uh, 86. Well, that's really close to that. Um, so 86, 86 uh, 86.6, 86.6 t. Let me say delta t fine. And then uh, minus 4.9 delta t squared. We're setting that equal to zero. What are the solutions? Well, let me get out my handy dandy calculator. I get minus 4.9 for A, 86.6 for B, 31.89 for my C. The quadratic equation gives you delta T equals to either 18.03 or minus 0.03. I think we probably want to go with that one, right? And so if I do that, 18.03, come on, let me out of here. Let me out. All right, here we go. So 18.03 times cosine 6.59 times 87.18 that gives me uh, 1561.5. So this works out to 1561.5 in my calculation. So I have to add 110.5 to that. And so the answer is 1671 point, well, I find 1672 approximately. So that's how far that one flies. How much energy is released in the explosion? 100 joules. All right, so let's figure this out. What's the kinetic energy? <clears throat> I'll work it over here. What's the kinetic energy before the explosion? What's kinetic energy before the explosion? One half m v naught cosine theta squared. One half m v naught x squared, basically, right? So that's one half. The mass was what? Ten kilograms. And the uh, v naught was fifty meters per second times the cosine of uh, thirty degrees, right? You got to square that thing. What we get? Square times five. Whoa. Nine thousand three hundred and seventy-five joules. How much what's the kinetic energy after? We have one half M B V B squared plus one half M A V A squared. So that was one half, we said it was equal mass fragments, right? So five kilograms up. VB we said was 10 meters per second because why not? And uh, one half, five kilograms. And we said VA was what? 87 point, what was it? 87.18 meters per second. You square that thing. And what do we got? Let's see here. So two, oop, oop. 2.5 times 100 plus 2.5 times 87.18 squared. And lo and behold, whoa, 19,251 joules. All right. So then what, how much energy was released in the explosion? the change in the kinetic energy, right, which is 
there you go. 98, 70, uh, 9,876 joules, basically. That was the energy released in the explosion with the things that I just gave you. So, um, if I had to guess how to solve problem 8.96, my suspicion would be that they just assume that the horizontal momentum is conserved and ignore the fact that their vertical momentum is nonsensical. That would be my guess. But anyway, any questions? Yeah. In this problem, it's only an explosion in the sense that like the pieces separate off, right? Like, there's no additional force <coughs> from when they separate. Like, there's no force like separating them from each other. Hmm. Because momentum wouldn't be conserved in that case, right? Well, the explosion happens in an instant, so there's no way for an external force to act, right? Okay. So they can push off each other with the, you know, exploding gases that are created by the, you know, the, the explosive uh, chemicals exploding. <coughs> but all of that's there already, so it's kind of impossible for it, the momentum not to be conserved. There's no external force to change the system. Now, it would be a very different thing if we were talking about something sitting on the ground and then exploding while it's on the ground, right? Then momentum doesn't have to be conserved in such a thing in this. I mean, momentum's still conserved, but the way it's conserved is that momentum is given to the Earth and then the momentum is given to the things that fly off. And so we can't really account for the increase of the velocity of the Earth opposite the, you know, the, yeah, and so there, there's, momentum conservation is always there in principle, but in practice it's not useful for certain situations. I shut up. See you guys Friday. Woohoo.